Okay, so I'm going to start a setting up a, a belt, and I've just rounded off the uh, practice stick so that to more or less simulate the uh, the shape of a body. So uh, just round it off, and now uh, the most important part of the front of the belt is the the belt buckle itself. So let's draw that in to start with. And it can be whatever size and whatever shape you want. And uh, get a little bit closer. There we go. And so then, from that, uh, we've got to take the belt out. And of course, it's going to be narrower than the the belt buckle. Okay. And then I'll go not too far away. And then we have to put the the loop. Do you call is that what you call that as a loop? So there it is on one side. Uh, so there is uh, more or less what uh, the configuration is going to be. And I'll use, a, you can use a V-tool or a knife, it doesn't matter which. Uh, I'm kind of a knife guy, so uh, I'll use a bit of both. So what stands up high? Well, the loops both on both sides stand up high. So I'm going to take the material off, turning the V-tool on its side so that I create the flat spot. Okay, and then I'll do the belt buckle, and again turning it on its side. And this one you have to go across the top. The loops you don't have to. And we'll remark that. A little bit difficult to see because of all the lines in there, but that'll give you the idea. So then I'm just going to carry on and we'll set up the a stop cut on the top and on the bottom of the, the belt itself. And you notice that I don't go all the way across, turn it around and come back the other way. That's your cut. I'll do the one on the inside first. Oh, a lot of little chips have to come out to make it work. So we're going to take that chip out of there. Whoops, I just went too deep. Make mistakes, you don't do anything, do Um, you'll have to edit this how you see fit. I'm just leaving it run. And I'll tidy up that belt buckle a little bit. Now that's the 
first Okay, we'll continue on. If you notice, it's just little chips I'm taking out. It's nearly like chip cutting. Push the tip of your Noah knife in and, and that'll create the slope. So there it is. The line's still on there, but we can start eliminating them in a minute. The key here is that you're going to leave the material below and leave the material above because a belt is pulled in to the body. And so the material in the shirt and the material in the pants below have to stay there. Follow me? Alright, so now there has to be a top of the pants and uh, they really don't show that in the diagram. If I can get that across here. You see they don't show the pants at the top and I don't know why but they just don't. Uh, you, you mean above the belt? Above the belt, yeah. yeah I, I thought there should have been some but I don't know. If you leave your shirt loose, you lose that. If you leave, you leave your shirt loose, you lose that. Okay. So if you wanted to have it billow out, you, you can do that. Otherwise, you better uh, create the top of the, the pants. Remember that the loops have to join in to the top part of the pants. Okay. So that when we come across here with the top of the pants, the loop has to stay there. Alright, so you can see now that the, the loop part here is joined into the top of the pants. If you want to clean it up and give it a nice shadow line, um, put a stop cut in there with your knife and remove the, the wood above it. But move, remove it on an angle so you get that puffiness required to simulate the top of the shirt. Okay, I'll shut this off and clean it up a little bit. So as you can see on this finished one here, that here are the, is the belt all lined up and down in this area here, you can see I've created the top of the pants. Um, the pockets in the back are simply outlined and you put a deeper cut in the top because that's where the opening is so you put a deeper cut in there. The front you can see where I uh, made a pretty good shadow in the top here to indicate that the shirt is hanging over top of the pants. The pants are pulling in underneath the, the shirt. The, put in the two uh, um, tags on the front here as well and a, a fairly big belt. Now the question earlier was about talking about painting. 
So wherever you, if you're going to paint it, I paint directly on the wood. This one obviously doesn't have paint on it. But um, wherever there's going to be a change in the color, I put a stop cut in. So I would have a stop cut, for instance, between the shirt and the pants or the belt. Uh, likewise, I would likely do a stop cut um, uh, at the top of the cuff as well as down here because quite often the cuff on a shirt is a slightly different color uh, but definitely a stop cut uh, between the hand which is a skin color and whatever color you're going to put on the the shirt. Likewise up here the shirt is going to uh, go into the skin at the top so you're going to do the same there. Uh, down at the boots uh, again, the boot is going to be a different color, so between the boot and the and the uh, the pants, you're going to put a stop cut in there. You may even want to put a stop cut in the bottom here where the uh, sole joins on the boot. If you want to make the sole a different color than the, the boot itself, quite often that's the case with a cowboy boot. The heel and the, and the sole is a, a dark brown where you might have a light brown on your on your uh, cowboy boot itself. Make sure that you paint underneath and paint at least the part that's above. Certainly on this boot here it's all going to be above so you want to make sure that you put your uh, paint, uh, you paint the bottom there because it's going to be visible. And everybody seems to want to forget but even if the boot is on the ground make sure you where the notch is going out between the heel and the sole that you paint that little section in there because that'll show up really well. Um, you'll also notice that uh, that's where I signed my my name and the date. And the reason for that is uh, that it is visible even after you've mounted it because this foot here is going to be straight. The, you can still see the date. Now one more thing about the skin. If you create the skin color um, everybody's got their own view on skin color. If he's a black guy, don't use black paint, you use dark brown. And you might want to use two different colors to create that. If he's a suntan guy, well of course you're going to give him a, a little bit of darker appearance. If he's a, a whitey, uh, in, in other words, he's not been out in the sun very often, well then he's going to be have a right, white complexion. But with the Caucasian color, <coughs> make sure that you after you've painted it, and I paint the whole thing, including the eyes, um, with the same color, the Caucasian color, whatever you choose, then go back while it's relatively still wet, or if it's not wet, put a little bit of water on it, but put a, a, a light up, uh, put red in mixed in with your Caucasian color, and uh, it'll give it a lightly, slightly reddish tinge, and then put it on the nose and the top of the ears, and maybe on his cheeks. So that then you can blend it in. If it's wet, you can blend it in. The lips, of course, are going to be painted a little bit deeper red. I use tomato spice to deepen my, my color to give it red. And don't paint the bottom of the lip, just the, the where the cut is, top and bottom. Don't try and get it over the edge because that just doesn't, that's not the way we are. If you look around at other people, you'll see that only the top. Uh, uh, and the bottom, the bottom of the top lip, the top of, of the bottom lip is the deeper red color. Okay, don't worry about anything now. And the next thing is you're going to paint the eyes, so you paint the eyes solid white. Um, you don't mix the, or you don't dilute the color, you paint it solid white. And then you go back in and put your pupil in after that. I use a uh, a toothpick, a round toothpick to do a lot of that work. Either that or a very fine uh, brush. You three or four hairs in your brush, that's plenty good. Once you get that all done, then you're going to paint the hair. So you paint the hair whatever color you want, but whatever color that is, make sure you do the eyebrows as well. Now, a lot of people will forget to do the eyebrows, myself included. And so then come back and what you do is you paint your your deeper color on your hair first and then use a lighter color over top. Never use just one color for hair. 
always use at least two colors and maybe three colors for hair. For instance, if he's, a, if he's a, an older guy and you want to do gray hair, paint it battleship gray. Then you put a cream or a, an ivory color over top of that, dry brush it, meaning that you only do the tops of it. And then oh, on top of that, you can use white so that you, you the lighter colors uh, try to accentuate the darker colors. So the darker colors gives it depth. Okay? Buttons can be left uh, without even being painted. But, and once again, make sure that around the buttons there's a, a deep groove. Okay? Uh, I think that's about the best advice I can give you for painting. Oh yeah, paint the hands. And if you want to give them uh, uh, fingernails, then uh, change that Caucasian color and put a bit of white in it and make them just a little bit whiter. Um, you'll notice that a fingernail is just a little bit whiter than the, the Caucasian color. Okay? But, and look where the fingernail is. It only takes up half the, the space of the bottom of that thumb or or a finger for that matter. Okay? So that's my advice for uh, for painting. Well, I was asked to set up some of the the uh, wrinkles and everything in the in the shirt and the pants as well, but we'll concentrate on the shirt first. So the first thing you have to do is get the foundation. You have to get the right shape. So I've more or less got it there. I haven't quite got it the way I want it, but uh, good enough I can always carve it off and play around with it again. So you'll notice that the the shirt comes down and it spreads apart, then it goes up and then it goes back down. On the other side it comes down. But there's a V, there's a notch in the middle that's going to be skin. I guess you could put a t-shirt in there if you wanted to. So it comes off and you you create that that shape in there to start with. <coughs> it should more or less end up with the center. The one coming from the other way has to come across because the buttons hang over. Um, and so it comes across the center line to create uh, where the buttons come. So. something like that. <coughs> so instead of creating this uh, V in here to start with, I'm going to create the whole collar and come down like that. Then I can come back and create the, the notch that's required. Okay? So you can play around with that however you want to do it. But that's, that's how I would set that up. The buttons I would use a uh, I decided to go to number 11 um, and uh, I would put it in uh, like that, okay, and then I turned the carving upside down and I put the, the two notches of the, uh, of the gouge in and then press it in and you can see how it creates the, the button. Uh, just be careful that when you start to remove the wood around it, that you don't pop that button off because it only takes a second to do that. But that's the simplest way to do one of those buttons. It becomes an oblong button, okay? But it's a very simple button to do. Just two cuts. The, the hardest part is to get the, 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 the notches of the, of the tool, of the number 11, and then just push it in. Okay, but if you follow that design by getting it in that notch first, it, it will, it will it stand up and it works pretty good. <coughs> All right. So then, in order to, when, once you get your button in there, and uh, let's just arbitrarily say that we've got a button there and a and a button there. If you make a, a notch in here so that it, there it pull as if it pulls, so the the button will will pull that way. Okay, so that will push the material of the of the joint this way. So likewise, in here, you're going to keep, create hollows away from that. So once you create the the edge, and I create the edge by grouping it in and out. 
and I can't see that and still can't see it very good. If I put a pencil mark in there, maybe you can see it then. And you see the, how the wrinkles are in there? So that it, this button here is pulling the cloth that way, so it stands this way a little bit. Then in between there's a bit of a hollow, and this one pushes it again, and then there's a hollow below it. Make sense? Alright, so then from that, uh, I w once I'm satisfied with that, I would put a, uh, I use my knife to make a stop cut in there, because then I have to remove material towards it. And I would pick a, a, a gouge, and this happens to be what, a number seven, uh, six millimeter. And so now I've got to create the other side of it so that I can start to create the wrinkles in it. And once again, see a bit difficult to see those wrinkles, but I'm creating the wrinkles in the in the the far side, I guess we'll call it, of the uh, of the of the shirt. Turn it around so I can get into it, and then I'm going to continue them. And while I'm removing the wood to create that shape, lo and behold, what it does is it creates the, the necessary wrinkles in the material. So it's a bit of a, a, like a number seven gouge has a bit of a curve to it, but you can see how the, it's creating those wrinkles in there. All right, if you want to have it make it look continuous, then you would start here and continue that all the way across using that same notch. So it looks like that. I have over the years changed from using a V-tool in here uh, to uh, using a high sided gouge and I would pick a, uh, a gouge about that size there. It happens to be a, a number 11 4 millimeter. It could be a bit smaller. So I can create the same texture if you want to call it that by coming off of there and So in that instance, I'm giving it a different texture by making the folds in the wood imitate what the way the material would be. So at a tighter location, you're going to end up with tighter uh, curves. Uh, so in the, for instance, in the arm here, uh, I'm going to have a, a notch in there like that to start with, but it's going to be tighter. So I'm going to have one there and I'm going to have one there as well. Likewise, I would try and do the same on the inside. Removing wood on the outside, um, I would pick up this number seven, uh, six millimeter again, and I, realizing that the elbow is the tight spot, okay, I'm going to come from the tight spot away. So you can see how the, that, what that does is it emphasizes that the, the shirt is really tight at this point but it's loose in here so you get more wrinkles in here and so it comes away from this pressure point it likewise comes away from the shoulder and comes down okay and from here it c comes up and on both sides to create the the arm and how the the uh, feature is going to be on the arm so don't be afraid to come in here and mess around with that. Don't forget that you've still got muscle underneath there, but if you remove the wood again from the pressure point, which is the point of your elbow, to a slack point, 
as you remove that wood, now you create that, the texture required in order to emphasize the, uh, the shape of the, of the body underneath it. So remove the wood in the direction of the pressures. Now the shoulder can be rounded off. It can have a sharp edge. Remember if he's got uh, a shoulder that is reinforced. Some cowboy shirts, for instance, have a, a very sharp corner here because it's reinforced there and and so you can create a sharp edge across the top of the shoulder if you like. So it looks something like that. I got some chips there it goes. So likewise on the back, now I don't have this guy's design. Who's got my carving? Didn't want to snitch on you, Tom, but the reward is too often. All right, so we'll switch from the unfinished one to the finished one. And so you can see what I've done here. See what I meant by the pressure points? The pressure points are here. Uh, if I was to do, this was done in uh, 2004, so it's a while ago. So I would put the scoops in here to show that the buttons are pulling it. And uh, you can see that I've use the V-tool in here, which I would like to use a gouge to. Now it's gouges over here, and again the elbow is all shaped with the pressure point still there. The back, it depends on what design you want to have. I, this line going straight across here indicates on a cowboy shirt that the, uh, there's an extra shoulder piece that goes across from side to side, but you can see that the the cuts are across, and there, these cuts down here indicates the compression of the uh, excess material over top of the belt. And then we go down to the to the leg, and of course in the back of the leg, because all the legs bend, they create these permanent creases in the back, don't they? The crotch, I remember that three pronged crotch, it's still in there, so a straight cut down the middle and one on each side front and back, the same thing applies, okay? And then the, the the shoulder is like an elbow, or the knee rather is like an elbow, because all, that's a pressure point, so the, the, the notches go away from the pressure point down below, of course, where the boot is pushing up on the, the pants, it creates a wrinkle in there. So that's what the, the whole design of those wrinkles are for, is to create the excess material and the pressure points where the material is drawn tight. Okay.